Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dial the Gate, the Stargate Oral History Project. My name is David Reed. Michael Shanks is joining us for this episode, and we are concluding season three of, of this show. I really uh, have appreciated everyone who has taken part uh, in this uh, extended season with me, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have Michael on to finish this, uh, this season out. If you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, please click that like button. It makes a difference with YouTube and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click subscribe. And if you click the bell icon, you will get notified the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net. Uh, YouTube channels. As this is a live show, uh, Michael is with me right now. So if you are in the uh, YouTube uh, chat, I invite you to submit a question. Only one question, though. So I want everyone uh, to be able to participate. So think of a good one and get it over to me. Michael Shanks, Daniel Jackson in Stargate SG-1, joining us uh, for this episode. Michael, it is so tremendous to have you on. I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, it just means the world to me to have you here. Thank you, David, and congratulations on on three seasons of your show. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. How are you doing? How are things? Uh, how are things going? And everyone, uh, keep in mind that we may have a little bit of a lag. So if if he takes a moment to respond, that's why. Um, I'm doing great. Um, other than you know. Oh, us being on strike and and uh you know uh being relegated to to doing nothing <laughs> which uh, allows me to spend time with my family which they hate but i love so um it's great it's everything's going good except for oh uh, yeah uh, let's tell the story about what happened this morning um if you notice me looking extraordinarily canadian today um <laughs> i just got hit with a hockey puck because that's what happens in canada no it, 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 i lost I have a I have a veneer getting revamped, and so uh, um, my tooth fell out this morning. Like <laughs> oh my god! So, uh, uh. yeah, it's a really attractive hot look. So um, uh, if you see me around your trailer park later on today, I'm just trying to fit in. Okay. <laughs> oh god! I you know th that reminds me, be life happens, and I have always I've heard the story from Cooper and from Wright about the appendix situation uh, at the end oh, of God. season three. Would you do me a favor and tell this story? I've never heard this story from you. I would love to hear it. Oh, God. Um, uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, we were doing, we were in the middle of shooting uh, the episode of Crystal Skull. And um, um, it was Canadian Thanksgiving. And uh, uh, I had had Thanksgiving dinner the night before. So it was, it was a Monday and we had to go to back to work on the Tuesday. And um, I started all day uh, from, from Sunday and, and to Monday morning, I had flu symptoms. And I was like, oh my God, I'm sick as a dog. And as opposed to like, you know, when you have the flu, it, it starts to get progressively better. You feel less nauseous and whatever. It was getting worse. And I, and I had this pain that had was was in my abdomen that never was associated with the flu. And I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. I like I I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go to work tomorrow. And as Monday progressed, I was getting worse. And finally, um, um, uh, we decided that it was best for me to to go to the hospital and at least get a look at. And um, and the whole time I'm just thinking I got to get to work tomorrow because you know as as you know in in our business you you, you can't just not show up. You can't get somebody else to you know. To, to, to fill fill in your job in the morning. So I'm like, okay, I, I, I just got to figure out how I'm going to get through this. And I get to the emergency ward uh, at Vancouver General Hospital. And I go in and I guess the woman, the, the nurse at the uh, check-in takes one look at me and she goes, stay right there. And because uh, I guess I was kind of white. And I was just, I kind of came up trying to be brave and like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm just feeling, some, I'm, you know, because I felt like whenever I go to a hospital, I always feel like I should be arriving there in an ambulance. Like I don't want to waste anybody's time. Yeah. So I was feeling bad for being there anyway. So anyway, about five minutes later, a doctor comes out. He takes me into the into one of the cubicles in the back, and he basically 
presses down and he t- asks me the questions and, and um, he says, um, I think we're going to have to go into surgery with you. And I'm like, what? What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, f- for what? He goes, for appendix. And I said, well, you haven't even done any like scans. Like, are you, are you sure? And he goes, we can't scan for this. I don't know if they can now or not. That's a, that's a good question. Um, we never did that episode on Saving Hope. Um, I don't know if you can scan um, to see if an appendix is is enlarged or whatever now, but I was like, like well, come on, you gotta be, like you're going, you're gonna, you're gonna cut me open on the hope that this is what it is, and and because it's, it's the only way they actually know for sure. And I'm like, um, you know, the, wait a minute, how about I go home? Because I'm thinking about working in the morning. I'm like, how about I go home and um, don't do it, don't do it, Hudson, don't do it. Oh. If a cat makes an appearance, it will. Um, Understood. So okay. You know, Go one ahead. of the two cats will eventually <laughs> show up. And, um, uh, and so I, I'm like going like, you can't just cut me. I said, I said, maybe I'll go home. And um, and if I feel worse, I'll come back. But if I, I feel better, I'll, you know, then, then we'll do surgery. Or if I feel worse, we'll do surgery. But if not, I'll just go home. And he goes, no. And I'm like, why? He goes, because you'll die. I went, oh, oh. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know that. This things I didn't know about appendicitis. So, um, I guess they, they quickly, like within an hour, I was under the knife. Um, and uh, I, I guess what had happened was that they, he just as he opened me up, and it was hiding somewhere. In, uh, it was had ducked behind my liver or something. Um, and uh, uh, just as he sort of opened me up. I ruptured on the table. My oh my god! Ruptured right then and there. So they had to like suction every. Like it was. I guess it was a big deal. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Again, I didn't. Things I didn't know because even the the stuff that ruptures out of you is the toxic is a toxicity that can uh, infect your body. So they had to. They were kind of worried about that. Um, so the next thing I know, I wake up and I'm in recovery. And I had asked. Um, I was with Vitiari at the time, and I'd asked her to contact uh john lennick um because i didn't have any handy dandy you know text cell phone email things that we had back we have now um and so i uh john lennick who was our line producer uh uh our production manager i think at that time mm-hmm. of season three so um and i'm like talk to john and tell him i'm not gonna make it like i i, I, I won't be there i don't think i'm gonna be there for work in the morning or you know and yeah duh so yeah, that, it's as simple as that. And so um, that's how close I kind of was and how dumb I was about um, making it to work. And so I was in the hospital for the rest of that week because it, you know, they cut through your abdomen and everything. And, and uh, I was hopped up on, on morphine and, and uh, they used my, uh, for a lot of the wide shots uh, in Crystal Skull in the actual cave sequence, they used my um, my stand in uh, for the as a photo double, and I just did when, when we did the next episode. Um, once I'd gotten better and was on my feet again, we sort of uh, did the close ups of, of me in that thing because we, we were darn near the end of the episode, so um, it all worked out. And then, of course, Rob, you know, trying to figure out what to write, how to write me out of the finale, um, just wrote appendix appendicitis. Daniel's got appendicitis. <laughs> you know, sometimes the easiest answer is the most obvious one. So uh, it all worked. It's uh, a, a continued uh, example of how you know, we have these extraordinary people going into extraordinary situations, but sometimes mundane things just happen to them. This is not a sci-fi show set in the future. This is in the here and now. And here and now stuff hits them. And it. I, I thought it was, you know, yeah, we can have this as a solution. There's nothing wrong with this. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I, listen, I learned a ton about appendicitis. I did, you know, I was sitting there going, "Well, before modern medicine, people just died of this shit." I guess. Yes, yes, yeah. sir. That's that's what exactly what happened before uh, anesthetics, uh, uh, anesthesia, uh, and that's what happened. That people just died. And you know, I was twenty. What was I? Twenty seven at the time. I could have died at twenty seven if I'd lived in the eighteen hundreds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which so, they uh, did. Yeah. So this the scene at the beginning of um, Nemesis was that shot a week later. How how far ahead was that shot? And I've heard a lot of it is ad libbed. Did you get your hair cut? 
<laughs> uh, there's a little, little bit of that. I think uh, it was definitely, uh, I'd been in the hospital a week and they'd already started shooting um, uh, the the finale uh, episode. I can't remember. What was it called again? It was Enemies or? It was or, Nemesis. Uh, yeah. Crap. Nemesis. And they already started shooting that and they had to do a bunch of stuff on the sub first. So they kind of reboarded it to shoot it on the sub. And then my stuff, uh, I, I so in between, I was shooting this stuff in uh, the Crystal Skull Cave, along with um, uh, doing the scene, like like my scenes in the in the mm-hmm. briefing room. As soon as I got back on my feet, so that would have been after the week in the hospital. Mm-hmm. I think I'd lost probably like ten pounds or something like that. And um, yeah. um, great weight loss program, by the way, for anybody <laughs> looking for a solution. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so shot the stuff with me in the control room, talking to the guys on the on the. Um, walkie and then um uh and, and intercutting with the crystal skull stuff uh and brad turner stuck around for that so that was that was great uh it, it was very accommodating uh, uh it's amazing what these guys can can pull off uh that what that production could pull off on short notice and, and uh yeah it was pretty that's pretty wild. cool that's wild man at th- yeah. one year earlier yeah. you uh be- between uh seasons two and three you got to perform what is uh, what I have seen is called the most coveted role in uh, all of theater. And I've never talked with you about this. You, you played Hamlet and I would love to know what that experience was like. First of all, I don't know. How do you absorb all of that, the, the, the Shakespeare jargon and, and, uh, how how the phrasing is that and then how, how how do you play the the most coveted character of uh in all of in all of theater and what what a rewarding experience that must have been yeah i mean uh i remember um morris panich who uh, is now out east he was a vancouver director uh playwright um extraordinaire for a lot of years one of one of vancouver's you know pride and joy artists um and he had wanted to do a production of henry v when i had just graduated theater school and i auditioned for him uh in the summer right after i graduated <clears throat> and i guess it went well and then i worked with him later on um that summer on a uh a, a mini series that i was doing about street kids and um and he still was talking about that and, and anyway we just got along really well blah 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 so about cut to five years later um out of the nowhere he calls me up and um and he asked if i want to be in hamlet and i was like oh geez wow yeah i mean what part and he says well hamlet mm, dumbo and i'm like holy shit are you serious like like you know like out of all the actors that you've worked with and you know i'm just i'm, I'm still pretty new because i was only out of theater school at this point for four years yeah. and um uh i was like you sure with all the actors in vancouver that would die to play that role like you know and he was like no when i saw you you know read henry five um uh i was gonna cast you then for that and i was like holy shit um wow so uh, anyway i was of course yes but now how do i make this work because our our hiatus was really only um uh november december January and we would start Stargate in February then. So we we, we were going probably like oh, nine and a half to ten months a year. We were doing SG one because we were doing twenty two episodes a season. And um, I'm going. I uh, how do I squeeze? I, how, how do we make this work? And they had scheduled it so that it was going to just bump into the SG one schedule. And so I said to uh, to Brad and the guys. Um, like this is a great opportunity. Um, Brad comes from a theater background as well, so this is a tremendous opportunity with a tremendous director. Um, can we make this work at all? Is it possible? And basically, it was like, well, we're going to need you because we boarded the way we, you know, done the two parter. We're going to need you. And I said, no, I, I don't want to be written out. I just, I just need can we board it so I can work around to to do to do this. And basically, what ended up happening was uh, I was clear up until the last week of Hamlet. Uh, performances and so what ended up happening was i would i i shot sg1 all day and as long as i was off by about five o'clock i could get to the theater uh to 
change and get Megabond to do uh, an 8 p.m. Uh, performance of Hamlet for that last week. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was all worked out and, um, and it was great. And uh, the, they wanted to hold Hamlet over, but of course we couldn't because I was, we were getting into the season proper. It all worked out. And um, uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, this is, the, uh, why do it? I mean, it's, 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 you know, uh, I, I had come yeah. just before I started Stargate. I had come, um, I had, uh, I, I had trained uh, as a uh, theater actor. Mm -hmm. I did, did my BFA in theater at the University of British Columbia um, uh, with Kendall Cross, by the way. Yes. Um, who I just saw that you interviewed as well. Yes, yeah, she says hello, by the way. Oh, great. Yes, yeah, she's lovely. I, 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 Kendall is like my sister. She, I've known Kendall. She was in grade six. I was in grade seven. That's how long mm -hmm. I've known Kendall. And, our, and uh, she might need to remember this or because I've told I, I totally forgot um, until I looked something up the other day. The first play, the first thing we ever did to her, Kendall and I ever did was I was in grade seven, she was in grade six, and we did um, uh, uh, HMS Pinafore. Oh, uh, my God. The musical. Uh, wow. In 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 L yeah. So that's that's how how far we go back. And then we ended up in theater school together. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um uh and I then I was like. just before again yeah, just before I got cast in in SG one, um I was at the Stratford Festival in Ontario. Um uh, first as an apprentice and then as a regular part of the company in 90, 1996. So that this was kind of like what I was groomed to kind of do um so you know the, to have this opportunity present itself was phenomenal and um um it is it is weird especially with that role because you you you, you know for a fact that at least half of the audience when you whenever you get into the soliloquies for that whenever you start doing to be or not to be you know very well that half of the audience is sitting there Because they know the words, <laughs> you're not going to be <laughs> able to fake well it. No, nope, you, you, they, they know what's coming. So all you can do is just, you know, you, you do you, you do your version, and let you know history sort out whether that was accurate or not. And and um, so it, it does take some 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 I guess some some uh, it takes a bit of a chip on your shoulder to, to 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 go up and do it because you know that it's going to be broken down. But it's also a privilege as well. So how can you you know turn your turn your nose up at that opportunity so it was it was great and um uh the theater company was excited because they sold a lot of seats because stargate was such a big property at the time <laughs> people came there for for daniel jackson and and uh, it was a great opportunity for me because i got to to to, to slum and do a little shakespeare and and uh, so it was a lot of fun yeah that's so wild and i imagine the muscle that you use to um absorb all that dialogue is not unlike the techno babble that well especially you know amanda and david hewlett had to you know spout week after week but you know you had long um you had long blocks of text too and it's how oh, do yes. you how do you how do you get it all to go in uh, in some cases the night before and have it all come out hopefully in the right order how do you do that is it just repetition <laughs> and just use it's a muscle i'm working this thing and you know I, I have I have to count on it. It's it's a muscle, yeah. It's 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 a muscle. It's it's um uh because I'm not so capable of it now because I haven't used that muscle for a long time. That um, your memory is a muscle, and mine was never that great. I had to really work hard to memorize things, so I would really have to like be at it as 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 my. I, I'm gonna, I can tell this story. My, my mother will be happy. She always would, knew I was memorizing lines because um, I would spend so much time in the bathroom. And I'll let you use your imagination on that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's, wor he's working. Yeah, he's working right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so, yeah. So, when, on SG1, I didn't, one of the funny things about it was when, when I would have long speeches to do, and that happened quite a bit, um, I would be up, uh, you know, till the wee hours of the morning um, and we had to be up later on in the wee hours of the morning. So some, some nights I was getting, you know, two, three hours sleep, maybe one hour sleep. Cause I was going home to learn this stuff. I mean, the, the, 
the funny thing to tell you an honest story is in the first season of the show, because of that, because I wasn't used to how to pace yourself doing a TV show. Um, I, I remember about halfway through the season, I, 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 I uh, turned to my girl and I was like, I'm going to die. I think I'm going to die. Cause I, I, I've never been this sleep deprived before. It was crazy. Um, just with, because it just continued like you, there was no slowing this machine down and night after night and then you'd drive and you'd be almost driving off the road at sometimes coming coming back home and stuff and you'd have to just have to get up and do it all over again and, and we as canadians uh we had crappy turnaround time we had a, a 10 hour turnaround time set to set so we'd get only be home eight hours total if we were an hour drive away we'd be home at grand total of eight hours so you have to sleep you have to eat you have to work out if you're going to do that learn your lines and drive back in you know to, to be back there for 6 30 7 o'clock in the morning next morning i'm looking for and that this is with civilized hours we shot civilized hours on on stargate so but i but i remember in the first season i was like well, i'm i'm gonna die this is terrible yeah. and then i learned how to just use my energy a little more you know a little more uh conservatively and not be like this all the time right there so. is there is a way to get it done i don't know if you remember but john glasner and brad wright uh played a, a bit of a practical joke on you before the season one i think it was the mid one of your mid-season breaks with the fire and water script do you remember this story <laughs> oh vividly <laughs> vividly speaking yes. of uh, i'm gonna die <laughs> uh yeah bradley we were we were on a flight to uh los angeles i can't remember what for it was something around the uh you know the release of the the series and we were on a plane um from vancouver to la to i can't remember what the event was either you know either the premiere of the show or you know, we have buyers convince something. We, we were always flying back and forth to do different things in Los Angeles that first season um, to sell the show. And um, Brad just, uh, he had just you know, basic typewritten pages. He just he, he leaned back and I was sitting a couple of rows behind me and he said, hey, read this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he, and I, and I read it. It's the, it's the um, teaser or what I think it was the teaser for, um, uh, that episode, the way it was constructed at the time. And I believe it was Daniel Jackson's funeral um, was the way it started. The, the episode didn't end up that way, but this is what he had written. And I'm like reading this thing going, uh, like when's the, where, when's the punchline coming? And then it, it just ends in, and that's the teaser. And then he's like, you done? I'm like, yeah. He's like, hand it back. So I hand it back to him. And he just turns around and faces the other way the whole the rest of the flight. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, "What the hell, man? I'm, you know, it's, I got my first job, and you're you're killing me with this. Like, why would you? Like, I, I I literally thought that they were killing me. I'm like, I guess they can do that. Can they do that? They can do that. I guess they can do that. Shoot, that was it. That was short. Oh, what did I do? Did I piss? You know. Anyway, I went this whole process, and when we landed. He took me aside. So I was just kidding. It's just an episode about this, that, and the other. So yes, it was uh, uh, a practical joke that uh, I certainly bought hook, line, and sinker. And um, uh, that's need, need all be said about that. Yeah, Brad was uh, was uh, had a good chuckle on that one for sure. Oh man, you know that's it's one of those um, uh, one I, one of those earlier great Daniel Jackson episodes. And do you you know, the the number of of people that you got to play off of that was the act i'm trying to remember the actor who played um nem in that situation he had also played he had also played tuplo but gerard plunkett gerard plunkett, gerard plunkett. you know michael shanks i can always count on you for for getting the right <laughs> names who are some of the people who came through those doors that you got to work with over the years that you were like I can't believe we, how did we get, the, how did we get them? I mean, I know we're Stargate, oh. we're awesome, but how did, we got them? Who were some of the people? Yeah. Over? So many, I mean, um, uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, some are, 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 are gone now, yeah. which is a shame. Uh, I mean, we've had a, you know, an epidemic, a Julian, um, Julian Sands. Oh my God. Passing away. Yeah, Isaac Hayes, um, Elizabeth Hoffman, Elizabeth yeah, Hoffman. Elizabeth we Hoffman just lost her. Uh, of course, Cliffy 
Cliff Simon. Um, uh, um, Carmen, Don, yeah. um, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I Willie mean, Garson. Of course, of course, those people, those are Willie Garson. Uh, yeah, that was, I couldn't, that was a, that was a shock. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the early going, I mean, uh, Elizabeth Hoffman, I couldn't believe that we'd gotten, I didn't know too much about her because I, I, I hadn't watched, um, uh, is it Sisters or something like That's that? That's correct. Tell me, a, tell me a little bit about working with her. Oh, she was great. She, she came, she was technically retired yeah. um, when she showed up because um, everybody, I didn't really know her that well. And so everybody was kind of, we got her, we got her. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know her. I don't, you know, I, uh, hmm. and um, so I was a little bit intimidated because of how everything had been built up. And then um, she was so, so great, but she said that basically she was kind of retired, but she read this, they sent her the script and she read it and loved the story. And, and, and so she was only going to do things if the story really resonated with her. And that one resonated with her. And uh, she came in, she's, she's a, she's a tough gal, she, but she's, she's also heart of gold, generous as heck. Um, uh, helped me. Cause I was, that was, that was my first big episode uh, to shoot. That was kind of the one that, you know, uh, and it was a, it was an important one to me too. Uh, and John Glasner was, was directing it. Rob had yeah. written the script, um, and it was a really great story. And um, uh, so she was phenomenal. And then she, we got her to, and the strength of that, we got her to come back from, uh, for there, but for the grace of God. Uh, so she came back a second time, and um, yeah, she was she was just lovely. She was she was, uh, of course, professional and and wonderful and generous and um and a treat just a, a a treat to work with yeah the um but go ahead the caliber of of these people is just i mean i always adored her and i i went to see her you know about a year and a half ago i sent her some flowers and i brought them to her door and i actually asked her a few years ago because in season eight's mobius she was invited to return um, to uh, kick off the story and, and she declined and she it was written instead her funeral was written in instead and I asked yeah. her a few years later I said you know if you had a second chance would you have accepted their offer to come back and she said yes she said I oh. wish I hadn't turned that down and so oh. s that that speaks to the caliber of the product that you guys were creating um, and what uh, you guys meant to her so yeah, she meant she meant the world to us too, and and um and I think <clears throat> too that she also recognized it wasn't just the the work we had done. She loved the people as well, and that was always one of our strengths to get people to come back. Was that um, both our cast and our crew were so welcoming and open, and um, um, and I think we were just because we were appreciative to have people come into our little world and those people weren't used to it because they're used to a bit more standoffishness. And as I've, yeah. you know, grown and done other projects, I can understand. Um, it's a rare, a rare um, atmosphere that we had there. It's not for, not every show has that. So. No. And it's interesting that you key in on Tormund of Tantalus. Uh, if I may take a moment, I, I saw you guys in first run syndication and I was, I was, I had never seen the film and I at that point I had, when we get to Torment of Tantalus, I was hooked by that episode. Um, that was the episode that really got me because it spoke to humanity's potential. It spoke to our potential and it spoke to the fact that there was this civilization, group of civilizations that came before us. And if we can get our act together, we could be a part of that and be a part of something greater, a United Nations of the stars, as Daniel says. And um, there's something, and, and it's it's reiterated, that, that, that kind of through line is reiterated again in The Fifth Race and a few other episodes, but God, what a performance, Michael. That was a good show. To be to someone who was like, I've was got the keys right here. You know, if I could just pick the lock and King Curtis is saying to you, you know, knowledge is worthless if you can't share it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was interesting. Uh, um, um, it was the first time on that show that little old me looked at it and went, that's what the show needs to be about. Like when you, we, we, we've been kind of like 
trying to dip in our feet in different areas and different cultures and whatever, and trying to figure out what the show was going to be. And that was the first time I went, that's what the show is. That's, that's where it lives. That's the best of us. That's what we can give to the, to the landscape of science fiction. Um, uh, it, it contains all the best elements in terms of uh, investment in other cultures, uh, understanding of science and the idea of reaching out um, to, 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 to be something better, um, as, as Daniel said. And I, th I think um, uh, John threw this into the script uh, afterwards um, because I think when I met with him and I was talking about it, I was trying to just go over some lines and stuff like that. And I, I just sort of said, like, I, I said to him just in passing, like, this is for Daniel, like, this is like meaning of life stuff. Like, this is like, you know, this is, and so he wrote that into the script. <laughs> he wrote meaning of life stuff into the script because I think he liked it so much. So, um, uh, which is exactly why I thought it was so great for the character. This was where his heart sat um, uh, and where I think, where I felt the show sat outwardly looking uh, on the landscape of sci-fi. That's the first time I went, yeah, that's the one. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I hope a lot of other people felt that way. And I think we continue to pursue that storyline, of course, as years progress as well. So, yeah. No, strong stuff. Um, I want to jump ahead a little bit to Mel Harris. Um, oh, yeah. Gosh. I, uh, <laughs> she has been really good to me. Like, anytime I've invited her to do something, she loved Oma. She loved that character. And I yeah. think that the the journey that Daniel started at Keb in season three um, was a perfect dovetail into season five um, for Meridian. And I can't imagine what was going on in your mind at the time. I'm sure there was a lot of stuff going on. I'm sure, you know, you wanted to probably move on to something else. But you have this great actress coming in and these god lights coming down from the ceiling. You know, I'm, I can't imagine how hot those were. Um, what was it like uh, sitting there and going all the way down into Daniel's soul with such an amazing actress? He's lost. He's lost Share. He's lost Sarah, and now he's um, uh, uh, given his life up for a civilization that's about to blow themselves to hell. Uh, what was it like doing Meridian? Uh, yeah, a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, that episode. I mean, it was. I mean, listen. In hindsight, it's a great piece of of, of entertainment. It's, I mean, it's you know sad as hell, but the way that we get there is honest. Um, and the way that we built up that storyline since the third season was there, sitting there. Um, uh, and boy, what a tough role for an actor to step into, uh, to play Oma to sell. Oh, by the way, you're this omnipotent being, you know, you're basically an angel and you're, you're coming in to get this guy. Go. Oh, okay, great. Um, and, and what I loved about it was the sort of neutrality that she kept the whole way through. There was no, you know, the way that she monotone th things through and not, not to, to, to use that term disparagingly, but to say that she kept a neutral perspective on everything. There was never a, a question of opinion of everything. If you, and, and that plays perfectly to, to Oma's walk the line mentality. Um, so it was a great choice to play. I mean, I loved her later in the diner <laughs> as the waitress. Um, that was way more fun. You want some um, motor oil? Uh, yeah, <laughs> she's great. Um, two pigs in a blanket. Oh, she's great. Um, but for that, like, you yeah, the perfect, uh, the perfect send off for that character. Um, uh, yeah. without knowing where this was going to land and, and, and what, um, you know, uh, at the time it was a little bit difficult knowing all the stuff that was sort of going on and, and the, the mixed emotions that you're sort of feeling in it. Uh, but um, as a, like I said, as a, as a, as a dual service episode in terms of accomplishing what's, you know, accommodating the, the actor and, and providing a journey for the character um, and having the audience fully emotionally involved it's a great it's a it's a great story uh, like i said in hindsight it's uh, i think it's a, a nice piece of storytelling rob did a great job with it that was brilliant it's and, nice. and for will waring had to do will waring will, will, it was will waring's first first episode for he was our camera operator and he had to direct the damn thing poor guy 
I'm like, wow, they they <laughs> threw you under the bus, huh? But he did a great job with it. He, had, he came in well-armed and prepared and and, uh, and continued to direct for many more years after that, too. So Absolutely. No, and it's one of those, you have to be sensitive about it because, um, you know, not only is this a, a, a character who's departing whom everyone um, uh, loves and, and resonates with, but uh, it's... Uh, it's since it's it's heavy subject matter, you know. I mean, and we're <laughs> we're it's it's actually actually fairly relatively topical in terms of today because the World War Three discussions are coming up again. Um, yeah. But uh, I think that it's just one of the finer hours of the show, and uh, man, you got a hell of a send off. That was good having Amanda and Rick and Chris there, having everyone having their moment with you, um, and then you know sending you on your way. No one was more divert, deserving of uh, the opportunity to explore the next realm than Daniel, you know, the the wonder child, you know, he had always, yeah, his as, eyes as, were as always the, wide open. Yeah, as, as, the, as the explorer, it's the perfect opportunity to be the guy that goes first in that situation too. So um, um, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was good. It was a good piece of writing for sure. When you came back, um, the character had a harder edge. And I'm curious to know how much of this was you, how much of this was the writers, how much of this was the two of you, the, the two groups working in conjunction with one another. Um, he kind of had the, the rose-colored lenses, you know, muddied up because he had been on the other side. And ultimately in, um, uh, in Threads, we'd find out why he was kicked out because he didn't like the way that they were going and, and treating people. Um, but the, the character had a harder edge and was much more cynical. Uh, and when, when Rick left the show, I think, my, I think Daniel took on some of those traits to kind of like, well, mm. now, now that Jack doesn't have a, a, an immediate voice in the group, I'm going to kind of take up like some of the snarkiness that, that Rick would have had. Do you agree with that? Um, uh, with that, in my interpretation of that. And, uh, why do you why do you think it was that um, that that was the case? Was that a deliberate uh, 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 approach to make him more cynical about the universe when he came when he fell? I think it was a natural choice. Like I think for the wide eyed idealist that he was when he went away and thinking that he was going off to someplace better, it's like going to heaven and thinking that you know we see the light and we go up there and it's just the same old bullshit in politics that it is here that you have to sit there and go, Oh, I thought this was going to be better. And you come back and go, you know, it's like how I, how you, uh, what's that? What's the, what's the, um, uh, Dr. Seuss, the, um, I had trouble getting the solace saloon where you never have troubles, at least very few. And you finally, and you, 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 you're about to go and then you decide you're just going to go back to the beginning and deal with your problems roughly. That's what your solution is. Instead of going to that idealistic place, let's, solve the problem here and i think that's what i guess so i do agree I, rob and i discussed it um um when he when he had called me up i was i was in uh south africa shooting a terrible movie um and um uh, uh he called me to, to talk about uh the idea of me coming back to the show and and i was in this this um headspace where i was in one of the most impoverished areas i'd ever been in uh filming with um uh, a shanty, you know, just out my window when I'm talking to him on the phone. And I'm like, you know, any problems that I had are, are, are seemingly, you know, minute in comparison to the real world problems that I'm just looking at. I'm pretty fortunate. Um, you as Michael so right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so discussing the uh, option of coming back, I was like, you know what? Yeah, we can work this out. And then, the way Rob had the plan, because Rick was taking a step back from from uh, filming, he wanted to spend more time with Wiley and and um, you know uh, take less time in the show, and, and so he wasn't going to be there as much. And so they needed somebody to step in. A needed to be part of the action sequences more. When I was totally open to that, because I've been kind of campaigning for that a little bit mm -hmm. um, before I left the show, and uh, and so. You know, they wanted the character more action oriented. I was like, sounds good to me, you know? Yeah. And you're not to be, you know, and, and I, I think the, the cynicism um, or the sar sarcasm, if you will, that um, 
eked out of Daniel that sounded Jack like is just Michael. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's where you know where I think that the the, the the switch happened, where the the James Spader interpretation got really put in a box, yeah. and it moved on to being a lot more like myself, and um, uh, which was again a lot easier to play than continuing to go back to that um, that uh, age old uh, characterization, and for the place I was at in life, it also made sense as well so um it all it all worked out and all made sense and it it also helped balance the show as well without jack being there as much um, um although you know we still missed rick's <laughs> wry sense of humor and wit and and um and uh improv uh all the time so uh what was it like um, but yeah uh, i think it was a good place so. what was it like working opposite that man yeah, um, and going th have it you you once told me you know they're such perfect foils for each other because it's it's kind of like it's it's Jack and almost mm -hmm. like his younger brother sometimes you just gotta go Daniel shut up whack you know what was it like um, uh, com complimenting that energy and and having you know some of those ex exchanges, those 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 on screen fights of like you don't you don't believe in mythology, rumors, lies, for you don't believe in my perspective at all. What was it like chewing those scenes up with him? Um, I I, I will I will couch it by start couch it by saying this. Um, uh, Rick is not the easiest guy to work with <laughs> on a regular day to day basis um because he's rick he's 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 kind of o'neill he's he's kind of grouchy he's kind of impatient um a bit short-tempered but he's also richard dean anderson the man is incredibly intelligent he's incredibly funny um he's incredibly talented um but some you know when you work with somebody all of us on, on that kind of schedule um you know your impatience and stuff comes out and I was new. So I was a bit more wide eyed and idealistic and, Ooh, you know, like me, like me, like me. And Rick was a lot more cynical and a lot more, you know, hit your mark, you know, like, you know, so there was a bit at first, it was a little bit, you know, there was this hot, cold aspect to it, but whenever we could get into that kind of stuff, whenever, you know, a talking to him off screen, we had a brilliant rapport. We got along incredibly well. Um, He's still a close friend to this day. We and we love the same things, and we, we we you know stay in touch as much as he allows us to, because he's not the easiest man to get hold of. Um, he's incredibly uh, um, he, he's 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 a he's a, he, he lives on an island in, in in not really, but you know if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but um, whenever it came to that stuff, what the common ground we always found with everything was humor, and when he started going off the page, I, you know, when I could counter that with just my own stuff that balanced it out, it was great. It was fantastic. It was, you know, lightning in a bottle. And, um, and that's when they started writing a little bit more of that, you know, and when, then we started doing it like, kind of like, you know, Laurel and Hardy started doing, Hey, do you want to do that thing? You know, that the, the thing thing. And yeah, yeah. Okay, great. And so we started almost communicating without words about how we were going to bounce stuff off each other and you know are we going to shoot this in a two shot so we could just do the banter and pick up the cue like that kind of stuff which is technical humor kind of stuff but it's what you know what we do in our on our side to make sure that what we're doing is going to resonate as funny with the audience and we'll just keep doing this till we till we nail it and nail the timing and stuff stuff like that so that was the common ground and so once we started doing that stuff then it just persisted and that was our common ground through all of it is you know um because it wasn't the, the situation um when it came to the personalities of the characters what i loved about it that was so similar to me as well because we we eliminated the need for language really early because <laughs> daniel as the linguist was unnecessary because everybody spoke bloody english Okay, well, th there goes one of my jobs out the window. So um, what ended up happening to a large degree is when we would go from planet to planet, all it was was I used to call it, it he's just the American and I'm the Canadian. 
So he comes in and says, why are you doing it like that? You can't do it like that. And I come in saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what he means is um, you seem to be operating um, very dangerously close to the precipice and, and we think you should pull back. So it was kind of like that, like he was the brusque American and I was the Canadian that apologized for everybody and was tried to say exactly what he said gentler. And that was my way of translating between the two parties. So that, that's, that's, that, that, was, that became a sort of dynamic of where Daniel fit in and where his relationship was with Jack which is trying to tone down his <laughs> brusqueness to every uh, other planet we would go to. Uh, I remember yeah. the, the scene. Talk about, talk about United Nations and stars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the scene in Red Sky where his men, uh, the, the team, uh, Rick's, uh, O'Neill's men are dead and they've shot the rocket to hell and Jack's just had enough. And he's like, I mean, I get on this apple crate in the middle of, of uh, the the village square, and I'm gonna tell these people who their gods really are. I'm gonna tell them that they're little green men or gray men, and 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 Daniel's like, I don't think this is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes Daniel could pull him back, and other times it was like, well, here we go, you know. Yep, yep, absolutely. <laughs> it's just wild. I want to go a little bit more. Um, uh, into uh, uh, a softer space with heroes. Mm. Can you tell me about um, uh, receiving the script for heroes? And I know it, it made a lot, they made a lot of changes to it. It got longer, yeah. you know, things like that. Uh, tell me about reading that. And, you know, what were your first reactions to getting to the page where um, Terrell dies, where Janet dies? Well well, to, to be 100% fair, we never read the script entire until we were almost done shooting the script, if you will, because of the way that that, and I'm sure you've talked about this with, with other people, um, the way that that was shot was it was what was called the second unit episode. Um, and Annie Makita was directing it. So we'd be doing one an episode. And they were doing it was just supposed to be kind of almost like a clip show that they were going to have this guy come in and he was just going to be you know and everybody was going to piss him off and we might cut to some clips it was kind of being the low budget episode that we were kind of kind of using as the clip show so that's how it started and um that changed when when they got um um uh, Saul Saul Rubinick. Saul, yeah uh, yeah to, to to play uh Bregman um because he came in with so many ideas um, that uh, I know that there was some controversy because he was him and Rob were like rewriting the script as they went because because Saul's a he's a writer he's a director he's you know and he's he's enthused about the stuff that he's part of he's and he likes to be active in it and Rob being smart sat back and don't turn your back on a good idea so you know and what was funny about it because I remember um, uh, uh, Mike Greenberg was a little taken aback at the fact that this guy was kind of coming in and railroading the episode, making it about him, like like that, that Saul was doing this in, in real life. And um, he was kind of like saying, like, like you got to, like, like Rick's not there, man. Like, you got to, like, put this guy in his place. And and I, as soon as I worked with Saul, I was kind of like, Mike, he's good. This is good stuff. I have nothing to say. What he's doing works. And so Mike was a little bit and but it, it all worked and that and it just kind of expanded from one episode into a two-parter and kept getting bigger because it was being shot like literally i would like say for example i would shoot half a day of scenes for uh, the episode revisions in season yeah. seven and then i'd go back to the studio and i'd shoot scenes for this other the second unit episode so we shot this over the course of probably four months so it wasn't until we were near the end that we started to see how it was all shaping. And then, of course, we get to with what you're talking about, um, the, the moment with Doc Frazier. Um, and the, the best, the, the most fair way to, to put it, again, I'm sure you've talked about this with numerous people, is that... Uh, um, we didn't know we thought we were done got this far uh, and so 
we, they wanted something big because it was such a good piecing out to be such a good episode. They wanted a big um, climax to it and an emotional stake payoff. And it can't just be, you know, Bob number 13, red shirt number four, because we need to feel something. And um, because we didn't think we were coming back that, that, you know, Dr. Frazier seemed to be a natural choice as somebody that the audience had grown to appreciate um, and that they weren't going to kill off one of the, you know, the, the, the four characters or, yeah. or in general Hammond certainly couldn't be there and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's still tough. Um, that's still tough to, 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 you know, but I, I guess I probably had possibly, I don't, I can't remember how the exact feeling I had, but I probably had less oh, feeling about it um, then thinking we were going to be done and also having my character having died already too, <laughs> that I was probably like, well, this, that's, that, that's showbiz, kid. Um, uh, but it was probably when we came back in season eight that I went, well, that sucks. You know, that we, we found out we're coming back for season eight. It's like, well, but we just did the thing. Yeah. Like, where's who's going to be our, our doctor? And and they 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 played around with uh, a lot of characters playing a doctor yep. in season eight um, that never quite found a home, and certainly nothing could re replace uh, Tarot. Could nothing nothing could replace Doctor Frazier. Nothing could re replace Tarot. And for Daniel to be there when that happened, that was important because Tarot and I had always we'd always played around because they were always playing around with the idea of uh, Carter and O'Neill. Um, um, and their, you know, uh, sexual tension, blah, 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 that just for fun, Terrell and I decided we were going to play that as well. To, there was influenced by absolutely nothing that we completely came up with it out of thin air. And we just did like lingering looks like we weren't even thinking that they were going to ever cut to it or use it. But I guess they got a sense that we were doing it. And that's why it became Daniel's job to, um, to be there and be that the um, the uh, I guess the uh, recipient of that firsthand mm. grief um, because we sort of had this 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 secret relationship that um, that only we knew about me and myself and Terrell uh, that um, they thought this is a good time to use that because Carter being there is a natural choice um because they have the, the established relationship but daniel being there it's like the surprise choice yeah. um and i love the fact that they also did that scene with bregman with with Saul and her so he had an emotional stake in it too that's that's good storytelling no um, absolutely yeah he likes her and um he's he's making a, a a connection with people there at the command and he gets it you know he's yeah. He's um, he's not just, you know, Ken Burns, journalist going in to do, you know, to uh, to get all this documented for the president and have it locked away for 50 years. No, he's he um, he connects with the people. And I think that that's one of the great things about the scene. Uh, but with the two of you in in uh, the uh, the surgery room uh, at the end, because he's made Daniel think. And yeah. um, and even Hammond comes around and says, you know, I'm a big enough man to admit when I'm wrong. This is a great yeah. part. Yeah, it was, and, and, with, and again, a lot of a lot of Saul's poking and prodding. And like I said, when one of the things that we always did there was that not a lot of people do because there's a lot of egos in this business. Um, is uh, is you know, best idea wins. And, you know, why the hell would I turn my back on your idea when I can take credit for it? Come on. Like, <laughs> you know, like it's it, it, so so the idea that that we would simply be territorial with, with Saul's notes and input. I'm glad that we didn't. And I'm glad that, you know, because it it's it's one of my personal favorite episodes. Um, uh, again, given where it started and how it was supposed to go, uh, just complete, you know, 180 from a clip show to one of the most heartfelt, you know, episodes that we did. And that character uh, in two episodes is more memorable than, you know, most characters on the show. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I've got some fan questions for you. Couple sure. of fan questions. Zuby force. When looking back um, at Spader's performance, 
Um, what did you? What were you carrying over into the show? And when did you feel more comfortable to add more and more of your yourself? Because I had just watched um, when I had watched uh, your, the pilot. I went back and watched the movie a couple of days later, and for a few minutes there, I couldn't tell the difference. It's like it's, it's the same guy. They got the guy, <laughs> and that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You weren't alone. You weren't alone. <laughs> and I'm like. I was I was I was I was blown away by some people not realizing that going it's James Spader he's been around since the early 80s like it's how could you miss him I'm not him I wish I was him I'm not him you know um uh wow uh, well I I guess probably after the probably around torment of tantalus ish and the only reason I say that was the time period was because um, that was when, right at that time, shooting that episode was when we found out that because we had started the show knowing that we were guaranteed 44 episodes, which is crazy. I mean, nobody gets that, especially nowadays, um, that we were guaranteed 44 episodes on cable. Um, halfway through the first season of filming, they renewed us for two more seasons after that. So we knew we were doing 88 episodes of television in the first five months, four months, five months. Um, and that's when I went, oh, my God, I'm going to be stuck doing uh, an imitation of another actor's work or another actor's mannerisms um, for like four or five, four, four years, five years. Like, who knows how long this could go? And, I, and that's immediately when I sort of said, OK, I got to start putting my own stamp on this and so i went to the to the guys and was like can we start pulling away from that and and of course and everybody was really open to that because they understood um they wanted that look you know and feel for the pilot now that i was the character and established the character that wherever i took that um so long as it wasn't dramatic or you know um uh, that, that that they were content to do that and, and we started to do away with some of the the mannerisms and the sneezing. Oh God! You know, oh God! Went away. Not soon enough, but it went away eventually. That was uh, that was in the in the movie that I was like, really, we're going with that? Okay, all right. Um, when was the haircut? Uh, so I, I didn't. I, when was the, the haircut, haircut was your push, him. or was that? Did you want yeah, that sooner, was or was it like two seasons is enough? Yeah, I've got really shitty. Uh, fine hair and so growing it long and keeping it like you know especially with film you got to for continuity reasons you got to keep it um uh it's got to stay still and we're filming outdoors in the pissing rain of vancouver and i'm getting the blow dryer run through like it's just it was a nightmare for me um who doesn't like to be high maintenance at all um and i was like can can you know and i said well hamlet's coming up yeah. I'm, i know i'm gonna do this in 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 the in the winter time um this would be a great time to you know, when Daniel wakes up in the out of the box, can we have? A, and I was saying, like in the, the next in the next season, can I have a haircut? And they were like, well, it's a two parter, and it goes from the end of the cliffhanger here to that one, so we had to do it now. And I'm like, can we do it now? So literally, I got that silly. Uh, we did a terrible first uh, run at the haircut <laughs> because poor Patrick hadn't cut my. He only was used to like working at it when it was long, so he hadn't given it a, a short haircut. And so it kind of like was a little bit goofy looking in the, the first uh, episode. Um, when I came out, I was like, okay, I guess we're going with this. Uh, whatever this is, like reminded me of the 70s all of a sudden. <laughs> um, but, that was, but that was part of like me putting a stamp on, a bit more of a stamp on the character, getting rid of the, the mop look and, and whatever and becoming my own version of this rather than continuing to, to rip off poor James, who I'm sure, you know, is wondering who the hell, what the hell that was. Uh, you know, as Kurt Russell uh, uh, <laughs> pointed out, that it was, uh, it, it was uh, a little too close to home, uh, I guess, the imitations. So. Well, for one, thank you, Hathor, for the, the freezing haircut, you know. In yes, the, absolutely. And and number two, dude, you rocked those sideburns. Holy cow. <laughs> it was the 90s, man. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's funny. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Jim Kite 
who was the biggest offender when it came to um, uh, ruining takes by cracking people up? Mm-hmm. Rick. Really? Rick, you'd argue that, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Rick, we, we, this is back in the day we, were, we, were, we would, we would uh, film with film. So we were shooting on um, on thirty five, yeah. And um, uh, oh boy, he had, we would have three lines, and he would run through entire mags in a, for one take. He would run through an entire mag of film, um, trying to get out those two lines. And in the meantime, we're off camera, busting up because he's either he can't remember it or he's yelling about something that he doesn't like about it or all this stuff. But it was always funny, and so we're killing ourselves off to the side and then you know when he's off camera he'd he'd continue to improvise sometimes and i'd be like oh my god (laughs) so yeah no definitely definitely rick and only to be usurped but he's only there for one episode but dom uh dom got us all uh all so i heard christopher judge said that ergo was impossible to get through because dom was just so amazing in that role. Can you tell us a little bit about Ergo? Oh yeah, well Dom Dom, Dom picked on Chris because Chris was so stone faced. So Dom <laughs> focused in on Chris, which is why so so all those those little Cree <laughs> like stuff like that was just completely improvised. He just throw it in when he when he ran out of something, he'd just be like a Cree. <laughs> uh, so because uh, so Chris trying to keep him- a straight face literally was the target of most of Dom's improving because he wanted to see him laugh and he got it because Chris is not hot deal in real life and and he and Dom's hilarious. Dom, you know, was in films. Um he's just the same off camera. He's a loving warm, was a loving warm human being and and generous and all the other things. Um but hilarious as shit on, on and, and again improvising and of course, Peter's directing it, so he's just keep it, keep it rolling. So we're just going through, and yeah, Dom was uh, Dom was wild. It was uh, it was a good time. It was a good time. Uh, uh, Emma Bentley, today is my thirty eighth birthday. Did you ever? I wanted to ask. Did you ever um, do any re- archaeological research uh, in preparing for the role, or was it okay? I got this on the page. I'm going to deliver it like a pro. Did you ever, were you ever interested in knowing more about what it was that you were peddling sometimes? Oh yeah, completely, completely. Um, um, I, I remember what, to, uh, for starters, I thought that before I, I, I took the role, or before we started shooting it, like I had, I had, we had, I got cast in January, I had about a month and a half off and I was in Toronto um, and I kept going to the field museum to go to the Egyptian section. Like that was going to help me somehow by being close to artifacts like that. So, you know, because I don't know what we're going to do with this. I don't know what, you know, like I'm so I'm just going there going, I guess I'm doing research. I, I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. I was just killing time. And I was excited about the opportunity to play the role. Um, uh, as time went on, yes, I wanted to know more. But we took the stuff and we bastardized it anyway. <laughs> So it didn't matter if I did any research for it. We were just taking it and throwing it out the window anyway, because we'd take it off in some tangent and say, well, you know, we, history says this happened, but actually this happened and this, it was this space battle, blah, blah, blah. And it'd be like, OK, forget this crap. I, there's no point in doing this. The only time it mattered was when I was writing for the show and then doing the research kind of was important. Um, uh, I, For example, like my input for the Crystal Skull episode was the Crystal Skull Uh because I was writing an episode um, by Michael Greenberg was kind of encouraging me to write. And so I was writing an episode or at least a treatment that included the crystal skull because our generator operator um, on set, uh, Costas, he used to talk to me like I was the character. So he had, and he had every ancient aliens conspiracy theory under the sun. So he would peel my ear off daily um, talking to me about um, all these, you know, accepted historical facts are all bullshit and they're all sweeping it under the rug and the Smithsonian's lying to you and all this other stuff. And he gave me books of all these 
basically conspiracy theories about, you know, artifacts found in the Grand Canyon and the Crystal Skull and all this wow. stuff that was kind of like ripe for the show. Yeah. Where I'm like, Costas, man, like you need to lay off the weed. Like, <laughs> but it was perfect. It was it, so, so the books he gave me became the prime things uh, that I, when, when I was writing, I went, well, just grab one of Costas's books and start peeling it back and let's read it. And so when I read the Crystal Skull Myth, which I didn't know about before, I was like, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, to this day, Michael Greenberg thinks that um, Indiana Jones ripped us off. <laughs> um, which I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, but pst, pst, we ripped them off first. Um, uh, I knew so yeah, Daniel uh, had a bullwhip uh, somewhere, uh, I knew uh, it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, totally, he does, but it's just in his bedroom, and I won't talk. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my god. Huh. Lexa, <laughs> hide she it. Know about it. It's, it's not for her. Jeez, <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. Uh, what was it like uh, having Lexa join uh, the cast in season nine? It's like finally we've got a doctor that's oh, not man. rotating out. What I what I love about that is most people assume that she got cast for something to do with me. And the hilarity of that is, and she reminded me of this last week when we were at a convention together, is that when Rob cast her in that part, the first thing I did was go up to his office and say, you cast my wife, really? Really? <laughs> Which was... <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he said that she had done the best job and... and and uh, and anyway, as it turned out, to, to be absolutely 100% uh, fair about it, um, it was great for us. We were parents. We had uh, two little ones at home. And um, uh, at that time, Tatiana and Mia. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, really, that was the only time on set was the only time we could sit down, have lunch and talk to each other without interruption. We could actually have grown up conversation uh, was at on set. And so it turned out to be a fantastic gift uh, to have her there. And, and, you know, she's friends with everybody as well. Yeah. So it was a, it was a real blessing. It was, it was a treat to have her. There. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And this, they say, you know, a lot of people are like, I don't want my spouse at my work, but this is finally the time that you could actually see one another, you know? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's absolutely true. It was, it was fantastic that way for sure. Absolutely. Um, Andy H. Do you remember any moments on that very first day of shooting? I remember the the camera ripped, I think, down the the uh, the film down the middle, and it was raining, and the sets were blowing over. Um, is any of those moments yeah. that you'll just remember forever? That first day, because it was so exciting for everybody, um, but it was the scene where uh, the first the, the first day of filming. Obviously, if people don't know we film this stuff out of order. Um, right. The first day of filming was just after uh, O'Neill blows uses the staff weapon to blow the hole in the side of the prison, and we're escaping with all of the uh, the captured people that they were going to try and host uh, and, uh, on uh, uh, Tulak. That's right. And um, and it, it, it's it's February in Vancouver, so it's monsooning uh with rain and this is when i you know first discovered the, the magic of having long hair um shooting in vancouver because it's pouring rain and we're we're, we're just trying to get through we have the first shots are with with like 40 people and the extras are getting soaked there was almost an extra revolt they almost because they weren't getting they were weren't, they wanted to shoot french hours to get us through which means no lunch breaks so wow. the extras were cold, wet, hungry, and ready to re revolt against the production. Um, we're, we're, who, we were, who were so excited. We we're like bringing our umbrellas over to them because we're like, oh, we just want you to be happy, blah, blah, blah. But in the meantime, um, yeah, the, I think the film became unusable for that entire day. So talk about a disaster, the Titanic in the making. It's like you break the bottle on the side and the ship sinks, right? And so we're going, oh, my God, 
have we just made the biggest mistake of our lives? We said we thought, we thought like, are we cursed or something? And and anyway, um, th there was I don't think there was a stitch of usable film uh, for that day. So we wasted a whole day of filming for absolutely nothing. And um, wow, everything after that was everything after that was downhill though because that was so awful that everything. But 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 as a first day, yeah, it's memorable because it was so like oh god we were like going oh no what have we done. What? I, I, I don't think it's our fault if we do something like that. It was those kind of feelings, right? Because um, we were so excited to start, and then to have it go that way was like, oh, my God. But uh, memorable, uh, to say the least. And, and as I always say in the business, when things go well, there's no great stories. Right. <laughs> it's only when things are go absolutely south do you get the great stories. The greatest filmmaking stories of my life come from all the crappy movies I've made. Not, not from the good stories. Stuff. It comes from the crappy movies because it it goes south so quickly that they're hilarious stories to tell. But the good <laughs> stuff was great to be there, but it's not nearly as much fun to, to recount. So. For sure, Gork uh, Gorsk BS. Um, Daniel Jackson was a massive inspiration for me to go get and finish my PhD. Um, how do you feel knowing you've pushed so many people into to fulfilling um, their academic dreams? I'm sure you've gotten this, this comment before. Yeah, um, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I don't know if, if, if like, when people say, I became an archaeologist because of you, or I became an anthropologist because of you, I'm like, are you enjoying it? Yeah, right. You know, don't kill the messenger. I'm sure there's less space battles in your life than there are in, right. in character's life. So um experience and they love it. Then I'm like, I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm glad it could be an inspiration. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, my first reaction is always reticence because, you know, I don't you know, Indiana Jones and Daniel Jackson don't sell the profession as, as it should be. I think it's a little <laughs> bit more, a little less action oriented than. Uh... That's funny. Yeah, I um, you know, there's, I I am always blown away by the number of people who I've come across who said, you know, I got into I got into uh, my career because of Carter. I've, I've I do what I do because of Daniel and the influence that you guys had over uh, so many people over the years can't uh, be understated. I mean, you you have been blessed to work on a number of amazing programs uh over the years and and i i didn't even, haven't even talked about unspeakable you know which i think was a brilliant piece by robert a very personal piece by him and you guys Absolutely. were amazing in that uh if anyone hasn't seen that god and, and lexa too lexa was good i mean you guys you guys did yourselves proud with unspeakable can you speak to that um really quick man I, I mean, I think that the best thing that I can say about it was uh, tremendously brave of Rob uh, to do that. That is encompasses a lot of um, his personal experience, um, both with um, uh, the disease and with um, his childhood, basically. Yeah. And... Um, um, even when he was was writing it, um, he had the opportunity and was writing it. And um, because it's such a dirt from that time period, there was so much stigma attached to uh, to having it, to having that condition that um, uh, it, like his mother and his family, they didn't talk about it. Rob didn't talk about it. We, I was aware that he, you know, that he still had, had, had dealt with it. Um, uh, but it was kind of one of these things, Rob doesn't like to talk about it, but he's also been trained not to talk about it. So it was accepted that, that he had um, uh, hepatitis and um, through transfusion uh, got this disease. And um, the stigma it was so much that even when he was writing it, and even when he, um, his parents were on set when we were filming it, his mother still was like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure wow. you want to tell this story? Because she, 
of her desire to keep it to and, 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 and he admitted openly admitted that of, of like like this is so now you understand why I am the way I am because this is how my mother was in reacting to to, to us actually filming this this show and here we are 2018 you know well removed from the the 1981 82 time period that that that, that you know this first happened to him um um and, and 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 we still like let's keep this under 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 the table Let, let's not talk about it um powerful stuff powerful stuff so very brave of him to tell the story um it's one of those ones it's it's t- it's a tough sell mm-hmm. entertainment wise it's a tough sell Talking it's not a comfortable thing to watch ailment, yeah no and it's not and it's not something because of the stigma and because of the coverage of it it's not something too many people i didn't know that much about it so i was educated making this thing because it wasn't part of my life um i knew people were going through it and it was something on the news in the 80s when i was growing up as a kid it wasn't something that ever affected my life so being that close to it i was educated by it but also it was so it was it, nobody talked about it it wasn't something that was, you know, like we're so open about everything nowadays. I think the Internet has opened it up and, and social media and all this other stuff has opened up almost too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. The conversation, yeah, if you will. Um, but then it was like, no, we, we, we don't because the people th- that had those ailments didn't want the stigma. And the people that didn't didn't want to know about it, no. you know. Well, um, anyone who's out there, I recommend watching it. That's true. Yeah, it's available on Amazon and um, and Google Play. Uh, it's an extraordinary miniseries, and uh, you play the father of one of the uh, the boys, uh, Will Sanders, if I'm not mistaken. Um, That's right. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a great show, and um, you know, it's one of those w- stories where it's like, yeah, this it's time for this to be to be told to people who didn't hear it before. Before yeah. I let you go, Michael. Um, what does this franchise mean to you? I mean, without it, I mean, you wouldn't have had uh, uh, Mia, who released her first uh, single, by the way, yesterday, which was amazing. I loved it. I had to, um, uh, um, uh, excuse me, Tatiana. Was it, Ta- is it Tatiana? I got got it mixed up. No, it's no, Mia. no, 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 Mia. Mia. Mia's the singer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean. Tesla she- filmmaker, Mia's the singer and actor. Okay, so I got she her single was great. By the way, I can't I can't rec- recommend that highly enough. Um, what does this franchise mean to you after all these years? What does Daniel mean to you? I think, um, boy, it, it, right. it's the fact that we're still talk, talking about it um, says a lot. The fact that I, um, you know, whenever you are doing something in our business it's all it's all snakes and ladders right like sometimes there's so much luck and chance that can affect a career every step you make every step you don't make it's literally one of those situations where oh man you didn't get a part maybe it's because this one was waiting for you like this kind of thing that it that becomes these opportunities that make uh, uh stars out of people or makes and for for th- that it means career opportunities yeah um, and so people always go, yeah, you did this for 10 years. Like, you know, don't you think that maybe that was, aren't you typecast and aren't you? And it's like, yeah, but I don't know what I would have become without this. Um, and what a great way to, to, to spend my time in years. I feel so passionate about this project, like as if they just seen it. And the fact that, 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 that those people who saw it when they were kids, <clears throat> excuse me, who are now adults are introducing it to their kids. And those kids are watching it with those same wide eyes and are appreciative of it. Um, it's given so much to my life um, um, and continues to, to, to give. So it's really the only project I, I have out of everything I've ever done in my professional career that I can say that about. And it continues to be a, a great source of, of positivity and um, and um, support and and conversation like we're just having um, and I'm I'm just like everybody waiting to see what the next incarnation of this project is going to be you know what 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 are they going to do with the, the you know I want Brad to do it but yeah. you know if, if 
if uh, they're not going to let them, then what are they going to do? And I'm, I'm curious. Uh, we'll see. I'll sit in judgment. Yeah, they're going to do something. And uh, um, it, they're, they'd be yeah. foolish not to uh, not to reach out to him and say, hey, at the very least, what are your thoughts? You know? Yeah, they've been foolish before, so I'm not putting <laughs> I'm not putting any uh, any any bets on whether or not they'll they'll do that. They should, but um, yeah. they're obviously permitted to do whatever they want. It's their sandbox, and they can invite That's whoever true. they want to play. With. Well, you guys did an amazing run. I mean, you're Guinness World Record holders. You you created entertainment that people love and enjoy, and people like me, you know, continually find uh, topical in new ways as we move forward. You know, it's like like the revision stuff with Neuralink and everything else. It's like, wow, we're actually doing that now. We're right. entering human testing. Right. So. Yeah, it's it's wild. You you guys were uh, prophetic in many ways, and hopefully, oh um, we it it speaks to the good in humanity um, that we can we sh- we should be so lucky to to reach the stars, and uh, you know if we can get our asses in gear, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not soon enough. <laughs> That's it. I have one small request before you go. Would you please do Thor? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, boy, um, the funny thing about Thor is Thor also evolved over time. Yeah, because he started off as as um, as uh, oh god, Michael memory. Um, when I was at Stratford, I worked with um, Dougie Rains, the actor who did the voice for Hal in 2001 and 2010 so i went you know if i'm going to do this character i said i'm going to kind of do him in that monotonic neutral form and i'm going to talk like this but over time the way he got more dialogue he started to become a little bit more like stewie from family guy and his voice kind of went up a little bit you know a little bit like this hey brian what do you think about that would fly the ship better you yeah good good so <laughs> i like the yellow ones <laughs> that's my best version of thor <laughs> ah thank you michael <laughs> thank you for this time together with you um thank you for everything that uh, you've done uh, for me uh, over the years always been there for me uh thank you for your work and uh appreciate you taking the time with us today Oh, thank you. Him? Oh, Appreciate there he is. Okay, we, we've had. I apologize for the the wire <laughs> the wireless issues, but uh, yeah, this was. Uh, I, I appreciate your time, and uh, and hopefully we'll we'll have you back for season four. So you have a great holiday. Absolutely. Be well, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Shanks, Daniel Jackson in Stargate uh, SG One. Um, this was a treat for me and I hope it was a treat for all of you. Um, these stories, uh, from such an extraordinary show are why I continue to, to do this and, uh, to be able to, uh, to share the, uh, the stories that, uh, make up such an important, um, uh, part of, of uh, sci-fi television and um, the stories of of hope uh, for the human spirit and the human condition are, I think, important because there are days that are dark and um, we are arguably in some of the worst of them right now. And I think that it's important to remember that um, there are there are people out there uh, who we can look up to and see the best parts of ourselves. And I think that the the show um, that Brad and Jonathan and Robert created uh, contains great examples of that. And Daniel is one of them.
So again, thank you, Michael. And I hope uh, all of you who have tuned in today, uh, I hope, I, I apologize for not getting to more of your questions, but uh, uh, this was uh, a, a really great episode and a great way to finish out my season. Thanks so much to my producer, Linda Gate Gabber Fury, for making this, uh, helping to make uh, this and every episode possible. My moderators, I could not do this without you guys. Summer, Tracy, Anthony, Jeremy, and uh, uh, Reese. Uh, thank you so much for for pulling me through this season. To Frederick Marcoux at Concepts Web, he uh, keeps StyleTheGate.com up and running. Uh, keep an eye on the website for when we'll announce the return of Wormhole Extremists. It will be in December, so we'll be returning with this SG-1 rewatches then. And I expect Dial the Gate to return around March, so that is my uh, current target. I appreciate everyone who's tuned in for this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. It certainly was was great for me. And thank you for tuning in throughout this season. We've been running 14, 15 months uh, this season uh, because of the writer strike and um, the the actors strike. It gave me an opportunity to really connect with people uh, behind the camera as well as in front of it. So I've I've had a privilege to uh, a, a privileged opportunity to really sit down with a lot more of the uh, production people um, because they haven't been working nearly as much as they should be. And at least the um, WGA strike is over and hopefully the SAG after strike will resolve itself uh, before the end of the year would be really nice. Um, but um, I, I really want to thank all of my contributors uh, over the course of the season. Everyone uh, who, who came on the show, we nearly hit a hundred episodes in season three. Um, couldn't have done it uh, without all the help uh, that I have from from everyone uh, on my team. So thank you guys. And to my transcript team, we are building a library of transcripts on uh, dialthegate.com for every episode that has run. We're about halfway through. Um, man, they are slogging through it. And uh, they're, they're doing amazing work. So thank you again to my team. Thank you to Michael Shanks for closing me out of uh, season three. It means so much to me to have him for this episode. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate, and I'll see you on the other side.